Um, I'll show you some work that's going on uh, right now that sort of hasn't, hasn't been published and not many people have seen before. So a lot of these things, if you're familiar with our program, you may have seen a, 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 bit, or, a bit or two of them. So, um, so uh, if you don't know anything about the World Studio, we're an architecture school, just like yours. Uh, uh, we're a five-year um, program in the United States. Uh, and our students come in as freshmen, 18 years old, they graduate at the end, 22, 23 years old, somewhere around like that, <coughs> just like you do. They go to classes just like you do, they learn the same things you do. Um, but perhaps one of the, 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 the little differences between the way uh, we work with our students and maybe you work here is that we are fundamentally a design build program. So everything that our students design in the classroom, they build uh, everything. So if you design it, you build it. If you build it, you design it. So what's really important in this work, first and foremost, uh, is that every single thing that you're going to see, every single thing you're going to see, has been designed and built by people just like you. Exactly where they are, or exactly where you are in your education. So the, 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 the power of young people who make a decision that they want to do something, and then they do it, right? that is remarkable. That's what you can do. The change that you can make in the world uh, today. You don't have to wait till you're older. You don't have to wait till you're grown up. You don't have to wait till us old folks get out of your way and let you work. Um, you can make a difference. So it sounds dumb when we say it, but the fundamental premise of our program is that you learn how to do things by doing them, right? Not just by talking about them, not just by reading about them, not just by studying about them. We do all those things, but if you really want to know how to do something, you do it. The second thing is, is that architecture is not a commodity. Architecture isn't something that, uh, or good design, I should say, is not something that just wealthy people, people that can afford it, get, and nobody else gets it. As an architect, uh, if we're a professional, like, say, a doctor is a professional, um, we have an obligation to act in crisis. So if a doctor is driving down the road and they see an accident, the side of the road. They have to slam on the brakes, stop, get out of the car, and immediately respond, immediately help. They don't ask if the person who's had an automobile accident has insurance or can afford to, to, to pay for medical care. A doctor, as part of their professional obligation, responsibility, has to act. If you know anything about the rules video, you know uh, some of the early work from the program. Uh, we started designing and building houses, and, and typically because we didn't have any money, and we were working in a very poor place in the United States, in, in, in western Alabama, uh, the rural south, uh, we had to build things using no money. So this house was built out of hay bales. Uh, this house uh, was really about collecting water. It's called the Butterfly House. It, it collects water in the roof so that the family can use it. Uh, this was a chapel, a place of worship. It was actually built out of automobile tires, filled with ram earth, uh, filled with earth, ram tied covered plaster, and became a, a really, really sort of celebratory place. So, built out of tires and an old barn that had fallen down, built out of nothing. Um, that's a little bit of the work that we're known for. Set the program in this direction. It's, it's, it's still going on today. So this, this, uh, this ancient Chinese marble, this is a really important touchstone for us, but the, the provenance of it is a little suspect uh, because it actually came out of a fortune cookie in a Chinese restaurant in, uh, at our university. So I don't know if it's really an ancient Chinese proverb, but it's, the proverb, but it's still pretty good, right? You can't learn this from the field. So what we take away from that is it's really important to get out in the world, right? Like we're all doing here, to get out in the world and see what's going on and, and, and you know, if you, want to, if you want to learn how to swim, you got to go to the river, right? You got to go where the action's happening, right? Really obvious. There's another less important or less ob less obvious part built into this, but infinitely more important, is that when you actually find yourself in a field, you have to wonder what in the world you're doing, thinking about swimming. That you should actually be thinking about what you can do in a field instead, right? And so that became really important to us. The place that you find yourself is where the work is. It's where the work happens. There's so much to do in the place that you find yourself. You don't have to go ranging around and kind of looking for it. The work will come to you. So this is our field. Uh, it's uh, very agrarian, very agricultural, very rural. 
It's uh, at the uh, sort of confluence of five major rivers in the, United, uh, in the United States. It's the Alabama River on one side, the Mississippi River on the other, and the Black Warrior, uh, Tom Bigley, and the Cahaba River in the middle, all slowly over millions of years, painting back and forth across this landscape and depositing soil from the northern part of the United States into the southern part of the United States. And it's what made the soil traditionally such a fantastic place to, to, to grow food. Um, this is the United States, of course. Uh, there's New York. There's Washington, D.C., Chicago, Los Angeles. Uh, there's the Rocky Mountains. Disney World is way down in the south. And that's Alabama, right there. Um, down in the southern part of the United States, southeastern part of the United States. This is our state. Uh, our program is associated with, with a university called Auburn University. It's on the east side of the state. Uh, Birmingham, Alabama, is our large uh, 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 business metropolis. That's where kind of all the money is, and, the, and this is what money there is in the state. That's where it is. Uh, Hale County uh, is the place where we work on the west side of the state. It's about uh, two and a half hours from here to here. It's a two and a half hour drive at 100 kilometers an hour uh, to get there. Um, Montgomery, Alabama is our civic center. It's where our seat of government is for the state. It's our state capital. And Selma, Alabama uh, is located in the middle. So that becomes important because this part of the world is, um, if you know anything about the United States, you, you, you may know that, that we sort of went through our own kind of uh, civil rights turmoil in the, in the uh, uh, 40s, 50s, 60s, and in the 70s, where uh, African Americans basically uh, worked through the, through the leadership of Reverend Martin Luther King and countless other black leaders to gain the right to in our country. All of uh, these sort of riots and protests and, and, and even the people who came from the, uh, and sort of led the civil rights movement came from the place where we were. And that's, that's also kind of a really important uh, historical touchstone. It's a place of, of great wealth. There actually is a lot of, lot of wealth, uh, even in, in, in this part of the United States. But it's also a place of absolute abject poverty. It's embarrassing uh, at home and, uh, in the United States. And I show pictures like this of where people live. It's, it's, it's uh, infinitely more so when I have the opportunity to go abroad and say that we have people in our country that live like this. But we do. And they matter. They're, they're our, these are our clients that we do that our school works with. Um, this is a mobile home, house trailers, uh, trailer on wheels. This is our competition. So this is really what we're trying to replace. It looks pretty easy, right? It looks like not much competition. But if we have time, I'll talk about it a little later. This is the stiffest housing competition, I believe, in the world. It's tough to beat. There's a lot of things about it that make it work to some level for folks. But that's, that's what we're in competition with. Um, in the United States, about 13% of our population lives under the poverty line. Uh, in Alabama, about 16% of the population does. In, in our county, in our, in our small county where we live and work, uh, over a quarter of our population lives under the poverty line. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a compared to the surrounding, it's a, it's a remarkably impoverished uh, part of the country. It's actually the poorest county. The counties that we work in are the poorest counties in the United States. Uh, that said, we work with some of the um, most honest and hardest working people you will ever meet. And in the landscape, we have some of the most honest and hardest working buildings to, to learn from. And so being in a place and being able to look at uh, the, the, the vernacular building in the place that you're from becomes really important. Again, you don't have to look across the ocean or look across the country or what have you. You can look around where you are and look at the way people used to build where you are. And you can learn really dramatic um, uh, uh, lessons. This one, this one is a great touchstone. It's actually not a house. It's a tobacco bar. You guys are keeping, keeping us at this. Um, this is our architecture building. Um, so I've heard a lot of sort of complaints a little bit about your resources, the place you have to work, you wish it was better. This is ours. Uh, we love it. Um, it couldn't be better. Uh, it's a really kind of a remarkable building to work in. It looks a lot like any architecture studio does anywhere else. Um, we have a faculty club, just like you have a faculty club. This is where our young faculty work and live. Uh, this is our worldwide headquarters of the Rural Studio. Uh, this is where our administration lives. Some of our students live. We do have dormitories.
stories for our students. Um, we are known for doing a lot of uh, material experimentation, but we don't experiment on our clients. We experiment on ourselves. So the students actually design and build housing for themselves. Uh, and you'll see that they're you know, very tidy and clean and neat and studious, just like, just like you guys are. This is what a typical class looks like. They look very much like you. Um, typically, we'll have 12 to 15 students in the program at any given time. Um, the way we work on projects is we start at the beginning of, of each semester um, typically doing what we call a neck down project. And what that means, it's sort of a misnomer, but it means that instead of you know, using your brain to work, you use your body to work. And very typically that will mean doing uh, a, a, some repair work, some fix up work. Often it will mean actually taking a building apart uh, relatively carefully, uh, taking it down, getting the material, organizing the material, understanding what it is. And so actually beginning to understand how you put a building together by taking it apart. So you take one apart first, you learn a little bit, and then hopefully you'll be able to put one back together. We do work directly with clients. In this example, uh, this is Rosalie Turner here. She had, it was Rosalie uh, live in a, a house that was falling down around her with two adult sons. Um, we, when we design things, we never talk about nouns. So I just said we designed a house, right? So we typically wouldn't even say we're designing a house. In this case, for Rosalie, we said we're designing a machine. Uh, designing a machine for living, actually. Um, we never talk about bedrooms and bathrooms and kitchens and, and, and living rooms and things like that. We talk about showering, bathing, shitting, hiking, eating, having, thinking, moving, praying, garden, celebrating, verbs, always action. How do, how do you actually use a thing? How do you live in a place? How do you live in a building? It becomes really important. And actually scrubbing the name of the thing out of your brain and thinking about how you live there becomes the primary component in actually to execute a new design. We work together uh, collaboratively. Uh, we work through a lot of drawings. Uh, it, it does get cold where we are sometimes. It, it gets hot. We don't have any heat or air where we are. So we put on our clothes. We take off our clothes. We present a lot over and over and over again. We talk out loud a lot about the work. We come up with a very simple diagram, just like you do. In this case, the idea was that we would, we would design Rosalie a courtyard house, that she would, uh, uh, would occupy one wing of the house, and her two sons would occupy the other. We work very quickly through um, models, make a lot of models. Models become really important. Um, you know, drawing and making models are the same. It's all kind of thinking out loud with your hand. So again, never talking about things without making something in order to think about it and talk about it. These things aren't to represent things. Drawings and models aren't to represent things that might be. They're a way to think about things that might be. Um, remember that barn we took down? At some point in the process, we go back and start looking at that the, the material so you can actually begin to see some of the barn materials being dressed and reorganized in the background of our shop. We actually make very careful and meticulous uh, construction documents. And then we get to building. So same students that you saw uh, that did the design work, they all also start building this, this project. So this is Rosalie's house in the background. That's where she, her and her two sons live. The idea was we would build a platform in front of it so they could s keep living in this house, even though it was falling down and leaking and all those sorts of things. They could build a, we could build a new house in front and then remove the house after they had the old house after they had a new house to live in. So here you can see some of the components that have been redesigned and reassembled from the old barn. Uh, sometimes it's kind of all hands on deck and actual, and actual construction about delivering material to the site. These are the bricks from the foundation from the barn that we took down. And then this is Rosalie on the very first day when she moves into the house where, so this is her coming up on the, on the front porch. Uh, and you know, she has a, and all of a sudden she finds herself with actually a functioning kitchen for the first time in about 30 years in her, in her life. It's a pretty remarkable day. But that very same day, we bulldozed, there's the existing house, there's the back of the new house. That very same day she moved in, we bulldozed the existing house and began to pour foundations for the new house. And then ultimately, this is the house today. Beautiful front porch, big roof. You remember the big roof from the tobacco barn? And then the courtyard behind. So the, the old house sat right here. That's the new house where we built this with the student's design and built this wing on the back of it. Sons and then the interior of her two sons, one who cooks and one who doesn't. 
So that's a little bit about the program. That's what we do. Students come, they come to us to study architecture. We have clients, sites, budgets, schedules. Uh, we work through that with the students. All of the work is theirs. They design and build. So pretty straightforward way to run an architecture school. But there are a whole other set of ideals in which we which we operate around. Um, the, what I was going to talk about overtly today was that sort of firmitas, utilitas, and venustas, which, which we all know from Vitruvius, firmness, commodity, and the like. Well, what you don't know, um, because that's really obvious, right? That that's what buildings should be about. They should be about uh, performance and, and what they provide, stewardship and energy efficiency. They should be about uh, social relevance. You know, all of these things that you know buildings should be about. For us old folks in the room, it hasn't always been that way. There was a, a period in, in architecture that most of us came through, and it was, I refer to it now as the isms. Uh, we went through classicism and modernism and postmodernism and rationalism and postrationalism and deconstructivism and blobism and ism, 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 ism. Whenever you start looking out in the landscape at buildings and you start thinking about what the building looks like, um, and you start being worried about what your buildings look like that you design, you're occupying the space of the isms, where there's these, architecture has these ideas about itself that actually come from outside of itself. That, that in order to gain some sort of relevance in the world, they had to look towards ideas and theories that were created beyond it. You live in a world today of this, again, this sort of firmness, commodity, and the like, Building performance, environmental stewardship, social relevance. Those are the things that architecture can find relevancy within itself. It's a, an amazing moment in architectural history, and you are going to be the ones who lead us there. So, all of that, put that in your cap, hold it there. All of those ideas are embedded thoroughly in this work. There's also these ideas of, of stewardship, it's sort of that middleness, that sort of commodity aspect, the firmness, commodity, and delight, and utilitas component. So where you see the building now, it's sort of washed off its foundations and sitting on the ground and falling apart. The church community didn't have a place to meet. So we came, worked, working with the community, actually took the church down, here's the original steps of the church, and built the new one using complete, all the material from the existing church. So all the wood on the interior of this building came from the old church. So, you know, some of the design ideas about it is it's a, it's a very closed building on the outside. You move through the entrance here, and as you move through the entrance, it actually becomes a very open building when you move out. Uh, it's, a, it's a Baptist church, uh, which is what we have many in the South. Um, so, uh, you know, sort of thinking about the beyond and how you move to, from life, this is our baptism here. So how you move from life to death, this is the cemetery out here through this death door, and that view to the beyond, Really important, really vernacular idea uh, in, in Southern architecture. And so the church sort of embodies that, right? It may not look like the original church, but it acts like the original church. And that's what you want to think about, what, not what your buildings look like, but what they act like. They look the way they look because of how they perform. They act the way they act because of the social responsibility that you have. So ideas of energy efficiency obviously become really important. Um, the little town where we live in, Newburgh, uh, again, 150 odd people, real problem with fires. We, we don't have fire protection, we don't have police protection, uh, we don't have garbage pickup, you know, there's no uh, uh, community services in this tiny little town. Well, we got a federal grant, the town got a, a grant from the federal government uh, of $800,000, so 630,000 euro, about, a lot of money for two fire trucks, right? So fire trucks cost a lot of money. That's why a lot of these small towns don't have adequate fire protection. They can't afford the equipment. So they, they got a grant for the fire trucks. That, that was great. But they were required to, to, to uh, have a building to put the fire trucks in in order to get the grant. And that building had to be able to, the, the, the tr one of the trucks holds water. So the building had to be able to keep the uh, truck from, uh, the water in the truck from freezing. Um, so I had to be heated. Well, a building that's big enough to put two fire trucks in, 
can't afford to heat it in a, in a, in a, in a sort of a traditional way. So uh, the town almost had to, you know, it cost, uh, in, in here it costs about $1,500 a mat of the euro conversion. What's that? 20, 20, uh, 13, 1,300? 1,300 euro a month to heat the building in order to be able to get the trucks. So the town doesn't have any money. They couldn't afford that. So they, they almost turned down the truck. We heard about it. We said, well, maybe we can solve that problem for you. So four students uh, uh, decided to take this on as their project, their design and build project. So they just, I won't go through the whole process, but they designed the project and built it. And this is basically under construction. And then how it works, it'll be one that all of you are familiar with, right? You have a concrete floor. Well, you got to have a concrete floor because you've got to have trucks parked there, right? So double duty for the concrete floor. In the winter, the, um, in the winter, the sun comes through this wall. You know how it works, right? In the winter, the sun is low. The sun can come through this floor, heat the building. In the summer, the sun's high. These slats protect the wall. The sun can't come in. The building stays cool, right? Works like a charm. We were able to do perform energy modeling on the on the proposed building, sell it to the government, the government gave them the money, they got the money, they got the trucks, we built the building. It's fantastic. Now ultimately what's important, so it's a great energy efficient building, but this is the first building that's been, that was built in Newbury, our town, in 110 years. Right? And so uh, normally what would happen now is that building would be built way back here, you know, off the off the street, right? So it has lots of, you know, there's lots of room around and things like that. That's just for some reason, that's the way we build in America. We pull everything back from the streets. But our students said, no, it's a town, it's a city, it's an urban building. There will be other buildings that come, and so it has to be an urban building. So this notion of pulling it up close to the street, brilliant. The students actually talked about, you know, someday there'll be another building and another building and another building in this town. And they have to learn, the town has to learn the organism of the town has to learn about what being urban is. Cities grow. You know, all cities came from the rule of people living in a place and staying in a place. It becomes a lantern for the town, and it also becomes a meeting place for the town, which ultimately will become important a little later. This idea of material efficiency is um, also really important, right? So it's not just how you uh, uh, reuse uh, uh, material and how you, you use energy efficiently, but also can you actually begin to use uh, building materials in a more efficient way. So this is a project, one of our projects that I would say is a beautiful project, love it, it's actually one of my favorite ones, but doesn't use material particularly very efficiently. Um, although the students, uh, and, and we at the time, thought that we were. So this is in uh, Perry Lakes Park, uh, there's a series of projects here. The first, the first project was a series of three bathrooms, right? So. Every part needs a bathroom. Um, we, the students decided that if, they were, if their project was going to be bathrooms, they were going to be the most beautiful bathrooms in the world. So the first bathroom, it's the mound's toilet. So you, you, know, you sit here, come through the door, you sit here, and when you sit, you look out the landscape. So you get this sort of you know, very redacted, beautiful view of the landscape. We call it the mound toilet, the ground toilet. So you actually begin to get this really low, the toilet is actually sort of down under the septic mound, or down below the septic mound, um, built into the septic mound. The project. The second one uh, is the tower. Pull it. So you come, you sit, and then you look up, and you have a completely sort of different relationship with the forest. So again, all of this is in a park, right? So how how do you, you take something that's so banal as a toilet and actually begin to Use it as a device that it helps you understand the place where you are a little differently, right? Toilet's kind of one of the few places, I don't guess we should dwell on too much, but toilet's kind of one place where we still kind of sit down and take a second and can just think, right? And so being able to look up and think is really important. The third one, uh, we have in the, in the United States, we have this uh, saying, you, you can't see the forest for the trees. You got that here? Something you got? Yeah, how do you say it? Yeah, so you can't see so you can't see the forest because of the tree, right? Well you can't see the tree because of the forest. It's interchangeable, right? It's sort of the world is complex, right? Well in this toilet, we're in the forest. And it's all about seeing a tree. Right? A single tree. 
So after the toilets, we built a, uh, it's, this is a flood plain. It's on the Chicago River, beautiful river. It floods all the time. Um, uh, every, you know, six months or so, it floods. So, but it floods very shallow. So we, so uh, in order to inhabit the forest, uh, the students uh, designed and built the board wall. And, you know, the, their idea was that they wanted to touch the ground lightly. Right? Well, so what we see in all of these projects, what architects usually mean when we say we're going to touch the ground lightly, it means that we touch it really heavily in fewer places. Right? So there is a shit ton of concrete in the ground in this project. There's so much concrete in the ground, it's beyond belief, belief, to get these things to pick up and hover off the ground. But this boardwalk goes to a very beautiful pavilion that the students designed and built. It also leads to a, a bridge, a 130-foot uh, bridge, so 94 meters, maybe, bridge, right? Is that right? Somewhere? It's long. It's big. It's long. <laughs> it's a long pedestrian footbridge. As soon as designed to go back, again, you can see it, a ton of concrete in the ground. But it is a beautiful bridge, so it spans this creek. It opened up a, a brand new part of the, the park that you couldn't uh, formally get into. It's done through a very relatively simple device to think of, but <coughs> difficult to execute. Three triangular shaped bridges, uh, one that balances on one end, one that balances on the other, and the third that sort of dropped down, after these two were built, dropped down in space and held, and then the walking plane hangs below it. Um, so these are, this is the structure the students designed and, and built, put it together in pieces, put it on wheels to take it like a like a trailer down the road with a giant crane, lift each of the pieces in place. And then, of course, this is the experience as you cross from one side of the, of the creek to the other. Now, what was interesting is you saw on the one side of the bridge there was a lot of concrete in the ground, right? A lot of concrete. If you look on the other side, it's wood because we couldn't get concrete across the creek. There's no way to carry it across. Right? So that changed the game for us. And this is where we really started to think about kind of efficiency. Instead of building in kind of these sort of traditionally contemporary ways that we just put a lot of resources in the ground to build, when we began to expand into the next part of the park, which the goal was to build a, a, a 100 foot burning tower. So it was like taking that bridge and standing it on end. Right? So the bridge was a hard enough structural problem. Taking and standing on end was a completely other problem. And we couldn't do it, we couldn't put any concrete in the ground to do it. Really had ourselves and the students scratching their heads. But ultimately they did it. Uh, they built another beautiful uh, boardwalk. Uh, you can barely see one of the support posts here. This is a double panel lever. Uh, it's about a uh, 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 12 meter double panel lever hidden in the cypress swamp. That boardwalk winds its way through the swamp. And ultimately, you wind yourself up at the burning tower, 90 meters tall. Um, so, what the students did, again, this is a, a, you know, not just a material efficiency, but they're also all these sort of ideas are tangled up with one another. Instead of actually designing a tower, they started designing a, a, a tower uh, that was 90 meters tall. It was sort of an impossible engineering task for four students. Again, there are four students working on this project, just like you. It's kind of an impossible task for anyone to do. Doubly impossible for, for, for four students to 